This right here is episode one of the Glofcast podcast, a podcast about whatever I want it to be. I'm that for a fucking answer. Anyway, this first episode is called Do You Want to Get Ahead of the Curve? Top 5 Musical Genres of the 2020s. So bear in mind that this is this is going to be some good stuff, you guys. This is, we're going to go deep. We're going to go looking into the cultural landscape of the next decade. It's coming here within a few years. Um, a little bit of a disclaimer, I am not a musician. I could maybe be a music critic if, critic if I really wanted to, such as in the realm of maybe Anthony Fantano or Deep Cuts, but just probably not that good. Anyways, I am currently looking into my crystal ball here, and it is telling me the top five musical genres of the 2020s. So if you're a musician and you're just trying to get ahead of the curve, these things right here are currently brewing. This is going to be something big, you guys. So tell your friends, get producing, get creating some music, because all of this is going to be big in the 2020s, and it is currently brewing. If you don't believe me, whatever, that is your loss. So without further ado, this is uh, also, this is not going to delve too deeply into any of the musical theory behind these genres, although it may scrape it, but rather it will talk about how these genres fit with regards to the cultural landscape as a whole. And so, um, without further ado, the top five genres of music of the 2020s. Starting at the bottom from the top five, uh, coming in at number five is Hypnagogic Bling Rap. And so you can kind of think of this one as Gorilla Zo meets Ariel Pick-ish. So, believe it or not, believe it or not, next decade there are going to be a generation of kids in the 2020s that think of bling rap, Soldier Boy era rap, as a kind of cultural memory, a relic of the distant past where rap used to be good, quote unquote, before being absolutely saturated by the trap sound of Migos and Lil Yachty, the conscious jazz rap sound used by Kendrick Lamar and Joey Badass, or the ignorant SoundCloud rap such as Lil Pump. So it's um, basically it's this is going to allude to the bling rap of the 2000s you know what i'm saying the ringtone rap it's um going to be viewed at through a hauntological lens so like i said yeah bling rap was coming back in a hauntological sense if you don't know what hauntology is i um, i recommend looking at jacques derrida's um specters of marx that kind of gives a little bit of a um, foresight into the concept of hauntology. It's, uh, I think, uh, cultural critic Mark Fisher called it the pretty much the musical ethos of our age, speaking in terms of the mid 2000s to the 2010s. And I have reason to believe it's going to persist into the 2020s as well. So the new kids were going to say things like, Trap has failed us, jazz rap has failed us, we need to go back, we need to mine these artifacts of culture. And so, yeah, like 3-6 Mafia, these, this is going to be ancient history for these kids. And this is where hypnagogic bling rap as a genre is going to come in. So this genre is going to allude to a post-9-11 yet pre-recession world where the idea of status will be de- and reconstructed through ironic utilization of said status. Chains and grills will become more mainstream than they've ever been, akin to the powdered wigs of the 18th century. Now this is... Pretty high culture. I don't know if you guys follow high fashion, but this is going to be the highest of fashion. You're going to have these fashion designers in New York City and London and whatever hip dipshit culture pr likes this kinds of stuff. So just be on the lookout for that. They're going to be wearing grills and chains. It's, they're going to be absolutely huge, bigger than they've ever been. So be on the lookout for that. Similar to number five, and coming in at number four is a genre known as Uncanny Rap. This is going to be a bit more of an underground technological development by basement nerds who create AI with the ability to speak and create their own beats and raps. But the only issue is this AI, being the underdeveloped piece of crap that it is, can get so it's almost human-like, but not quite. So instead of playing instruments, producing, or rapping in the traditional sense, creators of uncanny rap will be actually programmers that toggle the AI in such a way as to make the uncanny valley 
very prevalent in this kind of music, either very noticeable or very subtle. It kind of depends on your definition of what the uncanny valley is. If you don't know what the uncanny valley is, it's like if you see a robot and you it's very human-like, but there's a little element of it that is not human-like, and that slight subtlety creeps you out to no end. There's no human element to it, and so that's the uncanny valley. If you've seen the movie... The Polar Express, and if you look in their eyes, they all look like either dolls or corpses. And that is why kids were coming out of this movie screaming and crying. And I'm, I'm not joking, that's why you get freaked out by dolls, but you won't get freaked out by like Wally -E or something like that. So, if you want a nice example of this in music, Macintosh Mac, eh, Plus's Floral Shop, it is insanely famous if you've never heard of it get out from the rock you've been under so that's that's kind of the uncanny valley in music and it's going to be similar to that and that except that the ai here is actually going to be um making this music not a human in the sense not a human pretending to be really bad ai it's going to be actual ai itself so the producer takes a back seat to the self-producing AI, so it'll be similar to earlier Vaporwave, but the context of the music itself will actually be different since the AI is making it, not the actual producer. It's Think of it in terms of almost being helped by the producer or programmed, so the producer is essentially playing God and the AI is the musician, so that is one way to think of it. So, and um, that's at, at least initially that's kind of what's going to go down and there will actually be live performances of uncanny rappers it will be in the style of chuck e cheese animatronic bands so there will be kind of you know like a look at a really weird robot tupac just kind of waving his arms a little bit and trying to rap but it's, it's just not going anywhere and so just think of a big robot creepy robot moving uncharacteristically and if you're kind of asking, well, why not holograms? Coachella had holograms. We're, we're reserving that for actual rappers at festivals like Coachella. Need I remind you, this is kind of lo-fi, low-budget stuff we're dealing with. It's an underground development. So nobody nobody can afford those. Let's be real. Um, maybe those developments will happen down the line. Um, I'm going to guess no time in the 2020s. Maybe it will. Maybe at the tail end of it when AI can make its own holograms and therefore show what it sees itself as to the rest of the world to show the audience how the AI perceives itself. That said, that will also require a little bit of self-awareness on the part of the AI, which, like I said earlier, may not be a 2020s thing. So just just wait a bit. A IBM Watson will be crushing the rap game. I assure you of that. Coming in at number three is a genre known as redundant EDM music, and yes, that was intentional, redundant electronic dance music music, and uh, I'm going to start this by asking, has this ever happened to you? Because it's starting to happen to my old ass. I was, um, you were, you're at a show for electronic music, and it, it doesn't really matter the genre. It can be, you know, big room EDM, like Afrojack, more underground rhythm or bass music like Ganja White Knight. Future bass, like Wave Racer, Trap Music, some, maybe some Porter Robinson-like, not actually EDM anymore, but whatever, we're still going to put it in that genre, like on his Worlds album, or really whatever, I'm on Tobin, Bass Nectar, I don't, I don't know, what do you like, what the hell do you like? Um, so the bass is coming, the beats are coming, and you are dancing, but eventually part of it all starts to sound similar which it doesn't actually lead you to dance but instead you just kind of sit in the crowd like some sort of jackass pondering the decisions you've made in your life that got you to that point i um i just went to 12th planet recently with my girlfriend about a month ago up in um, minneapolis and um that's kind of what i was doing for parts of it it wasn't really um there was a lot going on but eventually it all kind of blended together and i was pondering my life up to that point so um maybe i'm just weird i don't know i i think think of redundant edm music as the logical extension of the current dubstep rhythm community applied in a more general sense so think of jazz think of bebop jazz and cool jazz kind of prior to that there was swing jazz which for all intents and purposes is like the edm of jazz what edm was to electronic music swing was to jazz so maybe you don't agree with that i i, I think it's pretty accurate so essentially 
with the dawn of bebop it eventually got so chaotic and stuff like that that it really was you couldn't really dance to it and so dancing with bebop took a back seat to either sitting or standing in the crowd kind of stroking your chin and being a pretentious asshole just kind of being like hmm interesting interesting and so that's kind of what redundant edm music is going to be so you're going to be at a redundant edm show indulging on whatever substances you like to indulge on whether it's alcohol or legal marijuana or just plain life and just pondering the meanings of life so a lot of times these are really good for like ambient shows and stuff like that so it'll be kind of flipped on its head a little bit. So the traditional drops of redundant EDM music songs will be will make up the majority of the song as opposed to building up to a drop as we know it now. Um, so it's going to be raising a question. What are the spots where the drops are supposed to go? And in that spell is going to be a calmer, more ambient spell will come in where when the drop, the redundant EDM music drop comes in, you're just going to be pondering your life and it's going to allow the listener to reflect. It'll be kind of like um, Strobe by Dead Mouse. You're going to be listening to that, and um, when that drops at a rave, you just kind of think about everything that happened in your life that got you to that point, and maybe getting a little bit sad about it, but there's nothing wrong with that. That just means you're human. Um, and with all of this being said, it's going to raise a humongous debate in the next decade of whether the term EDM should have the D dropped entirely. Well, um, like I said, stay tuned. I hope you don't plan on dying here in the next few years because that'll be a hot topic in the coming decade. And I'm sure there's also a subset of you that may equate redundant EDM music as something similar to what Aphex Twin, Autiker, or whatever dope IDM artists that you like right now. Or what they were doing a few decades back. To which I'm going to say... If we can rebrand French House by adding anime avatars to it and calling it Future Funk, why can't we do it here? So, checkmate, bitch. I'm just kidding, you're not a bitch, but, um, checkmate. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Now, bear in mind that redundant EDM music may not carry that name. It may just be called redundant music. Who knows, man? Uh, there's just going to be something similar to that. But coming in at number two is going to be a genre called Glacier Grunge. I, I had a hard time coming up with this one. This was, I had a few ideas, which I will mention in the honorable mentions. But um, number two is Glacier Grunge. So essentially, Glacier Grunge can be seen as the successor to the short-lived... Maybe it's still going on. Maybe it's just really, really small ocean grunge movement which itself was a spin-off of Vaporwave. So if you view kind of C-Punk, Vaporwave, Ocean Grunge as in terms of some sort of narrative within that realm, you can kind of think of Glacier Grunge as the natural successor to Ocean Grunge. Maybe maybe it'll be like Glacier Pop or Glacier... Glacier something, I don't know. It may just evolve to Glacier, who knows. So... Early Vaporwave, essentially it alluded to an overly consumerist, capitalist faux utopia where artists from the ocean grunge genre, such as Poseidon and Chains, allude to the inevitable destruction of that photopia, a world of post-Vaporwave pollution where the adherents face an unforgiving void of an ocean contrasted to Vaporwave's hyper-realistic appeal. So Vaporwave, it was really kind of interesting as it was a large experiment. It was kind of an intellectual movement forward in terms of, um, as opposed to a sonic movement. It was kind of a sonic development, but it was largely primarily in the first post-ironic music genre that was an intellectual leap as opposed to just a plain old sonic leap. So that was kind of interesting about that. It was kind of the ethos of the decade, in my opinion. So anyways, Glacier Grunge, within the confines of the Vaporwave, Ocean Grunge, Glacier Grunge narrative, so... Essentially, Glacier Grunge is going to be, by definition, anarcho-primitivist. So, Vaporwave view it as an anti-capitalist or even Marxist genre. So, Glacier Grunge, it's largely going to be just anarcho-primitivism. So, it may evolve, like I said earlier, it may evolve into just playing Glacier music. music who knows? It is a musical allusion to... Subtle second chances. The rainbow over the flood after God flooded the world. He sent Noah the rainbow as a type of covenant. So think of it in terms of that being an overarching motif. So it is um, elements of Glacier Grunge are going to be cynical sincerity. 
so it's going to be kind of icy and cold at times, but I mean, it's called freaking Glacier, what do you expect? And it's going to be partially optimistic. Think of it, if you know Ocean Grunge, a lot of what characterized that was just a feeling of despair. So this one's going to be cautiously optimistic, cautiously kind of think of the Ice Age that happened after Ocean Grunge occurred. So it's Ocean Glacier Grunge is going to have kind of a little bit of a light at the end of the tunnel. So instead of dwelling in the misery of traditional grunge, post-grunge, or o Ocean Grunge, so 70% of Glacier Grunge albums will feature a picture of Ted Kaczynski in some way, shape, or form, or maybe the first Joy Division album, or second Joy Division album, closer, who knows. Um, so Ted Kaczynski and Joy Division are going to be two of the main motifs of the genre, at least initially being an anarcho-primitivist genre. You, that's kind of to be expected in such a way. But... Um, with that being said, there will be some acoustics, but there will also be electronic developments in that. So it'll be kind of ironically anarcho-primitivist. We will um, see. So it will enjoy a little bit of mainstream appeal and similar to C-Punk, it, it'll be highly ephemeral. Like Rihanna's gonna see some glacier grunge and kind of rock that for a day. I don't know what's gonna happen. It may not be Rihanna, it'll be Beyonce since she's like the hot topic or whatever right now. So. That's number two. Coming up next are the honorable mentions. Honorable mention number one. I only really have two. I, I was trying to think of a third one. I was trying to look for a third one in my crystal ball, rather, and it just it just didn't work out. It just did not work out. So the first genre of the 2020s, which is an honorable mention, it is actually going to be called genreless, which it is... Luckily going to be short-lived, but it's really just a really shitty fusion of a whole bunch of other genres that the artists who call themselves genreless put together in order to be all things to all people. So you have Islamic black metal polka, acoustic trap yodeling, some Doug Mook trying to fuse bass, hip-hop, jazz, blues, funk, trap, whatever, thinking he's going to be the next Pretty Lights or something. And just a bunch of dumb shit, but that's why the genreless genre was short-lived. And it just, the genres are helpful, let's be real. It is short-lived to listeners getting pissed at the pretension of the musician who thought that their music was the first to be without a genre. So, fact is, genres are useful because classifications are useful, but to get bogged down in them is just largely a waste of time. If you like genres, if you like music, Figure something out that was kind of similar to this, but if you're getting bogged down in like, oh, I think it's death core, not death metal, then move move on. Move on with yourself. Unless you really, really, unless you're like a botanist or something and you get caught up in, I don't know, genuses and species and you really need to differentiate that badly, then by all means do it. But I, I, I like to think people have better things to do. And then the other honorable mention is Peg Step which is essentially Electro House used by girlfriends who were trying to convince their boyfriends to take a strap on up the dumper. But it's very niche, underground, short-lived genre as well. It is like, I don't know, the sexual revolution 2.0. That's going to be a big thing. It will be, that's, I'm not going to be talking anymore about that one. You can kind of look that one up for yourself. It's not an actual genre right now, but I just kind of found it in my crystal ball somewhere. So those are the two honorable mentions. They're originally going to be three, but the other one, the crystal ball, kind of clouded a little bit over. So we'll, uh, yeah, and then the number one genre. The number one genre of the 2020s for music is going to be a genre known as meta gospel. So despite its name, it will be a secular musical genre that is in the style with some pastiche. It's not going to be a mean one of 19th and 20th century gospels and spirituals that will ironically place the focus solely on the performer itself as opposed to any traditional theological implications almost in a mid-90s Gallagher Brothers Messiah Complex stadium rock kind of way. So it will be akin to gospel music where the focus isn't religious in a typical sense but religious in that the gospel performer is being deified. So in a way it's like the gospel of gospels or meta gospel. 
So think of the dynamic between the metagospel performer and the audience as similar to several humongous early to mid 2010s EDM DJs, but driven to an extreme that is even more absurd than that. So the new metagospel movement will utilize the new technological developments of the late 2010s and early 2020s in it, whatever those may be from a musical standpoint, but the true innovations with Metagospel will be with regards to performances themselves. That's kind of a running motif of this top five list, is it's a lot of it's kind of more akin to performances themselves in context, as opposed to maybe musical innovations. So the post-Metagospel era will see a large number of performers from different genres value anonymity and music over their egos. So... If you know the DJ Marshmallow way, so he has a mask and nobody knowing, or at least supposed to know, who he is, so that'll be kind of, it'll become a little bit more of the norm. You're not going to really have this, you know, celebration that the um, performers are going to be a little bit more anonymous when they can get away with it. So that's just kind of to protect their anonymity and to kind of keep the focus more on the music. So... Anonymity will be protected in more ways than just that. So if you look at like the dawn of social media and platforms like Twitter or Bandcamp or SoundCloud, musicians and performers are more accessible than they've ever been. So if you contrast this to like the 80s glam metal and hair metal, stadium shaking rock where fame and inaccessibility were essentially synonymous. So it's kind of going to take that. So it's still going to, you know... It'll be very interesting because they'll be inaccessible, yet, I guess, anonymous. You won't really be able to kind of talk to them because they don't really want you to talk about them. It's just kind of that kind of development. It's kind of going to deter a few people away that otherwise would have just gone into it just for the fame alone. So Metagospel takes the dynamic for a genre that didn't traditionally focus on that and focuses on that, and that being the huge like deification of the performers in question um it focuses on that from a musical and performance standpoint so it's the satirical predecessor to the ultra anonymous movement alluded to earlier before they kind of take the marshmallow route and hide behind stage and don't really want anything to do with their fans that's kind of how it's going to be so that is the number one and anyway, this is going to be the top five, or this was the top five musical genres of the 2020s. Uh, if you're a musical producer, get on this and you will be the quote unquote next big thing. This has been episode one of the Glovecast. It's kind of going to be a little bit of dumb shit here and there, but there's also going to be some sincerity involved with it. This was a very shaky first episode, but I did hope you found it enjoying. Enjoy. I hope you enjoyed it, for fuck's sake. And, um, yeah, I'm going to try to make this a weekly thing. And um, we're coming in hot at 23 minutes here, almost. Eight, seven, six. All right, thank you very much for watching. Take care. Bye-bye.